BSFO is honored to have Dr. Kirsten Bibbins Domingo join us for our COVID-19 We Need to Talk series. Uh, Dr. Bibbins Domingo is the chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and professor of medicine at UCSF. She co-founded the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. We are just absolutely delighted and honored to have her with us. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, remind you to please submit your questions via the chat only, and to submit your questions during the presentation so that once we get to uh, later on in the, in the half an hour, then we can go ahead and share the questions with her and she can answer them. So um, again, feel free to submit your questions via chat during the pre presentation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bibbins Domingo. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to, to participate in your discussion today. Um, I'm gonna just get my screen up. Okay, um, so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about uh, disparities in COVID-19 and to move from the, the national landscape down to our local level and then to end by describing a little bit more about what types of activities we're engaged with in, in at UCSF to address some of the inequities that we're seeing. So here's what we know so far. Um, this virus has the potential to affect all of us, but all of us are not affected equally or equitably. And there are clear disparities that have already emerged in COVID-19. And we know this even though the data is not yet complete and we don't have uh, enough of the type of data that we need to really get a fuller picture of this. We know that African Americans are overrepresented among uh, the deaths from COVID-19. So here, these are data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and all of the states in orange are states in which um, African Americans, amongst the deaths from COVID-19, they're twice as high as their representation in the population in these states, including our own state of California. So you can already see visually, this is quite a number of, of states around, around the country. New York City is one of those areas that has been uh, particularly affected. They report their COVID-19 statistics normalized for the size of the population and also age adjusted. And whether we're talking about uh, hospitalized COVID or deaths from COVID, you see that both uh, African American and Latino communities have higher rates than whites and Asians um, in their data. New York City, New York State, and uh, New Jersey are the areas of the country that are, are highest, uh, have the highest rates of COVID-19 disease, the highest per capita rate, but right behind them is actually, oh man, okay, sorry. Right behind them is actually Navajo Nation. Um, and Navajo Nation, a much smaller community, has the third highest per capita rate and really um, uh, is, is uh, remarkable and um, in need of a, of a greater response. So how are we doing in California? California has done a great job in putting out the numbers. These data are not always complete, but helping us to understand the picture of uh, COVID-19 in our state. And what you see here, if you look on the, the last column here, it shows the percentage in the population. And you wanna compare these to the percentage um, amongst uh, the deaths from COVID-19. And I think the two groups that stand out uh, consistently, and those numbers have been fairly consistent over time, are African-Americans that are 6% of the population, but about 10% of the deaths from COVID-19, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, a much smaller population, 0.3%, uh, but uh, disproportionately represented amongst the deaths. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, so these are our numbers in San Francisco. The thing that's been most striking in San Francisco is the disproportionate uh, representation of our Latinx community in San Francisco. They make up about 15 to 16% of the population, but amongst cases here, 36% of the cases. 
And uh, another way to look at this is to look at the map of San Francisco and look where you see the western part of the city uh, pretty much um, with, with very scant number of cases of COVID-19 as, as opposed to the eastern part and particularly the southeast where really um, that's where most of the cases are in our city. So why do we see these patterns um, that some communities are disproportionately uh, burdened by COVID-19 compared to others? I think there are a variety of reasons. They fall into three big categories the way I think about them. The first is um, the increased likelihood of exposure to the virus. So um, this is a really interesting graphic that uh, um, came from the New York Times. And uh, they basically used cell phone data. And they looked across 20 large um, cities in the US and they said, how long does it take people to shelter in place? And what they found was that wealthier parts of the town shelter earlier and shelter longer compared to poorer parts of the town. And, um, and this was seen consistently across all of the cities that they looked at. Now, why might this be? It might be that we are not getting our messages out to all of our communities uh, where we live. Um, we, we are all now very fluent in language like social distancing and flattening the curve and shelter in place. Not all of those messages are communicated effectively to all populations in all languages. Much of the messaging we know it, it, that comes from our public health departments and the government may not be received with the same type of trust uh, in all communities. Um, and we also know at the beginning there was a lot of misinformation that's probably continued over time. I know amongst African and African American communities early on there was the, the, uh, the misinformation out there that maybe black skin made you immune to the virus um, and, um, and many people worked to debunk that. Um, the sources of these types of, of misinformation is, is always hard to track down, but I think we can all agree we're probably not helped by the fact that um, that uh, this virus was labeled early on as a Chinese virus, um, because all of that really um, leads to targeting of particular communities and also misinformation to other communities. So I think that's a part of the delay in sheltering, but I think there's also more, more importantly, also um, in poorer parts of town, we also have um, more overcrowding. It's actually harder to shelter and to be socially distanced in the way that public health officials might like. And then over time, um, many in, in our communities and in uh, poorer areas of town are also um, have to continue to work or, uh, and, and to care for, for families and loved ones. And those are things that are often driving people um, out of the ability to, to really effectively shelter. Um, we know in particular that, um, that uh, essential workers at this time, the people who are not working from home and who are in all of our industries, um, uh, grocery stores, retailers, people who produce food, people who distribute food, um, people who are security guards or janitorial staff. Um, these are people who are on the front lines. And just like healthcare workers, um, who we oftentimes um, think of and uh, who really are on the front lines of taking care of COVID-19 patients, anyone who is out working has an increased likelihood of exposure. And this was a nice feature in the, in the LA Times really highlighting the range of types of work that people are doing that put them at risk of exposure at this time. We know that amongst our healthcare workforce, and especially in California, we have a, a fairly diverse healthcare workforce. And this was a nice piece on, um, on the nursing ranks showing that Filipino Americans are, are, are overrepresented in our nursing ranks. And in California, 20% of our nursing uh, workforce is Filipino. The last big category of, of places that put you at risk for higher exposure to the virus are what we call congregate settings, where people live together um, in close proximity. And we know about congregate settings because our first uh, introduction to this virus in the US was thinking about uh, people coming from cruise ships. But the congregate settings that we're worried about now are, of course, the homeless shelter. I pictured here an outbreak that happened in one of the homeless shelters in San Francisco in the largest one. 
The other thing that we know is that the biggest uh, uh, numbers in terms of outbreaks across the country and even in the state are happening in prisons and in jails. Um, and we need to pay strong attention to that. There's an important one happening right now down in LA. Um, and then uh, nursing homes is, is a really critical one as well. So 30% of all deaths from COVID-19 have happened amongst nursing home residents or staff um, in California. And that's a pattern that's seen across the country as well. So the first reason I would highlight is increased likelihood of exposure to the virus. The second I would highlight is the increased susceptibility to severe disease. So um, we know that after age, the thing that puts you at risk for having severe COVID-19 disease or dying from this disease is having another condition like hypertension, heart disease, asthma, diabetes, or kidney disease. And we know that all of these are conditions that are more common in poor and minority communities there are more of these chronic diseases. And one of the most important things is that these are conditions that are happening at younger ages in these communities as well. So one of the things that's been striking in this pandemic is to see um, uh, not just that there are disproportionate uh, rates in uh, Black and Latino communities, but also that Black and Latino uh, uh, individuals have been dying at younger ages. So they're well overrepresented amongst the people who are dying at young age from this disease. And let's just look at the same numbers that I showed you from the state of California and now focus on when, who are the deaths among people who are 18 to 49 years old, right? So just this subset. And here again, focus on the percent in the population and the percent of, of COVID-19 deaths. And what you see here is really striking uh, uh, increased burden among Latinx populations, African-American, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. And so this is where I think we see that, that disproportionate burden playing itself out even more. The last thing that I would highlight is um, decreased access to healthcare. So right now, if you look at maps of LA, you see more cases and especially more severe cases in, in poor sections of LA. Early on in the epidemic, though, we actually saw more cases in the wealthier parts of LA. And this almost certainly had to do with the fact that testing was happening in those communities and not in other communities. We know that there's been, uh, that we've had, uh, we've not had full access to testing um, for, for all of our communities. And early on, um, uh, because testing really had to take place in the context of a, a clinical evaluation, um, people who uh, might not have access to insurance or other access to a regular source of care um, uh, also had a, a burden to getting testing. This has changed over time, and um, there's more testing now of essential workers, certainly in San Francisco, um, uh, but it's, it's taken a while for this to happen. One of the things many other others are worried about that I, I won't highlight here today is the concern that access to um, the types of treatments that we have for COVID-19 as they become available and access to ventilators, um, especially in areas where, um, uh, where these are scarce resources. There are many who are concerned that these might uh, not be utilized in the same way across all populations, but the data is still uh, uh, being developed for that. So the third thing that I would highlight is that, unfortunately, we've seen this all before. This is, this is nothing new. Um, we know that there are big patterns of health disparities um, in the communities we're talking about. And the virus um, has come down and, uh, and sort of distributes across these existing uh, inequities and makes them worse. And, uh, and that is, in fact, what we're seeing. And in fact, what we see in prior pandemics that play themselves out in exactly this way. And it's really striking to think that it was just 10 years ago that we were in the midst of the swine flu pandemic. And much of what I have started to write about in this area has used this rubric for, for understanding the causes of the disproportionate impact in Black and Latino communities. 
But this rubric came from people who were writing about the swine flu pandemic, where we saw exactly these patterns um, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago. So um, I, I and many, many others have been writing about this. I think that this is not a time when we can just sit back and, and look at another health disparity because we see them so often. We oftentimes become immune to them. I think this time has to be different because we have a global pandemic of massive scale and uncertain duration um, that will be really devastating to, uh, to all of our communities. And so we have to, to pay attention. We have to pay attention and think about this more proactively because we, in a, particularly in our diverse Bay Area and diverse state of California, live very uh, highly interdependent lives as anyone who if you're sheltering you know if you're having food delivered or you know when you have to go out the people you're interacting with um, we can, cannot afford to watch um, uh, some communities being disproportionately affected both because we need to relieve suffering in those communities but also because um, our entire approach to managing this pandemic and keeping all of us safe will require a focus on these groups that are that are disproportionately affected. I think this is also critically important because we're entering a global recession and all of the things that are required for managing a pandemic well, being able to have shelter, being able to have ready access to food without having to go out and forage for it, all of those things really require an attention, uh, have, having a job, um, all of those require attention to, uh, to thinking about this in a much more holistic uh, sense if we're going to get this under control. So I'd make two big take home points. Um, the first is the pandemic exposes deep pre-existing inequities. COVID-19, the virus can infect everyone, can affect everyone, but the impact of the pandemic is not going to be felt equally. And the most marginalized communities will be disproportionately affected and must receive additional attention. And then the second point is to understand our interrelatedness both globally and locally. And protecting our Bay Area, I think, requires a focus on ensuring that all communities remain safe. I'm going to turn now to talk a little bit about UCSF and the types of things we're doing at UCSF. Um, one of the questions always is, is what does an academic institution like the University of California and UCSF in particular, what is our role? And I think our role here we thought of in the context of providing clinical care, um, providing education and expert consultation, and doing research and providing data. So um, we're fortunate in the Bay Area, and I know that you've heard from other uh, public health officers that in the Bay Area, we have not seen the type of overwhelm of the healthcare system that has happened in other parts of the country. And so after we prepped and were uh, prepped for the surge that we were hoping would not come, and then we didn't see come, we were able to, uh, to help uh, many of our, um, uh, our healthcare workers who volunteered uh, to go to those high need areas. And so we have sent doctors and nurses to uh, serve in New York City, as well as to Navajo Nation. And, and each of these groups are probably 20 to 30 have gone out and in each of these groups. I think it's been striking because we've had well over 200 volunteers. So I think um, it, it's always inspiring uh, to see um, our, our healthcare workers um, uh, understanding they're at higher risk, but wanting to, to go and, and really serve in those areas of greatest need. Um, this is, I'd highlight here the work of the UCSF uh, Latinx Center of Excellence. This is de directed by Dr. Alicia Fernandez, who um, uh, is somebody you might want to hear more from because her group is doing really outstanding work, um, particularly um, because our local uh, pandemic has been very much focused on our Latinx population. Uh, there was a lot of concern that we were not getting uh, education out uh, in the best way possible to, to uh, communities in the language and in partnership with um, uh, ethnic media and other community-based organizations. So this center has really um, done, done a lot uh, um, with, with media, in webinars with community-based organizations, and in, in thinking about um, uh, research as well. And here are just many of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Fernandez, who's the director, 
uh, Marlene Martin, uh, Will Martinez, Amy Beck, um, doing the, the Zoom and FaceTime Live uh, to try to do uh, education directly with the community. We have groups that are focused on these specific high-risk populations that I've talked about. AMEND at UCSF is a public um, health criminal justice reform program uh, that has really provided um, intensive uh, expertise and consultation with uh, the California Department of Corrections and doing training webinars directly with correctional officers and uh, uh, physicians and nurse practitioners who are working in these settings. This, again, um, all of, if you look at all of the outbreaks, the, the top 20 um, outbreaks in the country, um, most of them have happened in, in, are related to prisons and um, understanding jails and prisons, um, both the people who um, are incarcerated as well as the people who, ca who are, um, work in those facilities um, has been a major focus of this group. We also have the Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative that similarly has provided expert consultation as well as webinars and other training to think through um, our approach to, um, to those experiencing homelessness during this time. Um, and as we look forward to, um, to the continued recession and already what we're observing in our communities, if, I don't know if any of you have seen the the sort of food lines or might have some in your own neighborhoods. I certainly see them in the mission. Um, uh, the, the impact on, uh, on food insecurity, which was actually quite prevalent in our communities already, um, but, um, but is only made worse during this time. There are many groups mobilizing um, uh, uh, food um, response uh, and nutrition resources during this time. This is a program called Vouchers for Veggies. Um, that's the, the statewide program. It was started as Eat SF in San Francisco um, that, uh, that provides vouchers for healthy fruits and vegetables um, and has, has really had a, a strong uh, foothold in, in this particular area and was started by one of our faculty, uh, Hilary Seligman, and is working in partnership with other of uh, these organizations to, uh, to really address uh, the hunger needs during this time. Um, one thing that you might have heard about was our, our efforts in the mission. So um, many of us who, I work at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, and many of us who worked there even before we had the official numbers from the city knew that everybody we were seeing in the hospital was Latinx. So we knew that this was a problem before there was any official confirmation. And we also knew that we had reasons to be concerned that not everyone was getting tested, that um, not everyone had access to care necessarily. There might be a particular sensitivity amongst, um, amongst our immigrant um, and um, undocumented uh, communities. Um, and so launched this systematic testing within one census tract neighborhood in San Francisco in the Mission District. This is a study led by Diane Havler and Gabe Cheney um, importantly, we launched this as a study because UCSF, you know, we do research and provide data. We're not out to replace the Department of Public Health, but in this case, we wanted to really get the data to help others advocate with the city and the Department of Public Health on the types of things that need, uh, the needs that were happening in this community. So this was free testing took place over four days. This could not have been done without um, very strong community partnership. Um, and because, as I said, there are a lot of barriers to testing. They trained, um, they trained over 300 volunteers from um, community organizations, um, our medical students, others, volunteers, uh, healthcare staff in the hospital who worked on this. This is the Brava Theater where they were headquartered um, and uh, still is providing the headquarters for much of the work that's being done there. Lots of partnerships happening across UCSF and getting this done, certainly with our Department of Public Health, um, but also lots of people providing technical input. Uh, all of the tests were run for free by the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, which was really outstanding. Um, and, um, and I think it, it took all of this coming together because this had to be launched very quickly. And they basically, from conception to launch, I think did this in about two weeks, which was really remarkable. They presented preliminary results on Monday to the community, and I think it's worth uh, reviewing those. They ended up testing uh, 4,100 um, individuals. And what's striking here is that this study 
and the testing in this study now represents about 30% of all the testing that's been done in San Francisco. So although we're leading with research, we're truly contributing, I think, to the overall public health response because, um, because we're reaching communities that, um, that have been more challenging to reach um, and, and I think by, uh, and also providing data that can continue to guide our public health response. Um, they, uh, most of these 3,000 of these are people who either live in that, in that uh, census tract or were working in that census tract but lived somewhere else. And then they expanded because they, um, at the last day, they tested a lot of other people who lived in neighboring areas. Um, this, we think of the uh, Mission District as a, as a historically um, a predominantly Latinx population, which it is. It's also a population that has many other groups um, who, who live there as well. And um, this, this about represents the distribution in that census tract, but this is the distribution that participated in this study. And here's what was striking is that among those 3,000, the prevalence of viral testing was 2.1%, which is actually much higher than these investigators um, expected. So I, I think a, a notably higher rate um, and that amongst those who come in to work in the census tract, a much higher rate than that uh, compared to those who are the residents. So really speaking to um, workers, people having to work at this time, really having higher rates of, um, of COVID-19, uh, uh, the coronavirus infection. The important thing here is that although the Latinx population represented only 44% of the sample, they are over 95% of the positive cases. 90% of those who are positive, more than 90% cannot work from home and are people who cannot telecommute are out and continuing to work and more than half are asymptomatic. So really speaking, I think to all of the things that we talked about on the national level, hypothesis of, of why there's more exposure, really bringing this home in this particular high-risk community in, in our city of San Francisco. I will say that the, the interest and, um, in, in the work that Diane Havler's group has done has led us to think about other communities, uh, notably the Bayview, um, uh, our homeless population, uh, Chinatown, and thinking about whether we can do similar types of efforts in those uh, populations as well. I know I've run long. I'm going to zip through these um, these maps, and then I'll, I'll stay on. I'm really sorry. So these are just some maps that show you what we've been doing to try to help understand our communities better. Um, these are um, this is uh, we wanted to make this available for researchers, but also for the general public to really understand um, your communities and the social determinants of health. So these are the types of maps that you can find on our website, um, healthatlas.ucsf.edu, and you can start to understand uh, the communities in the, in the Bay Area better. Those communities that might have higher burden of food insecurity, you see those here in blue, higher burden of um, severe rent burden among those who are lower income, you can see these here, and I urge you to explore these more yourself. Those areas that have limited English proficiency where we have to get our word out in other languages. This is the census tract that Diane's group um, looked at, and you can see it's predominantly Latinx. Um, but also importantly, this is a, a, a poor community. This is the number of poverty among families with children under five. Understanding what we do with children and during this time, how to keep them safe is a really important um, air feature in this pandemic. Issues related to overcrowding, you see here in the China, in Chinatown, but also here in the mission, are, are continue to be an issue. And then I will say here on the map, um, we also have all the COVID cases throughout the state, and it's something that's really interesting because these are updated daily as well. So again, I'm going to go back to the two take-home points I said before: the pandemic exposes inequities, and we have to pay attention to the most marginalized community, but we also have to understand our interrelatedness. Um, because that's the only way we're going to keep all of us safe. And then I would say that we and you at UCOP um, are trying to um, use our expertise in the ways that are appropriate to, uh, to help our own communities, uh, both um, locally, regionally, statewide, and nationally. And I'm sorry for running over. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, 
Dr. Bibbins Domingo, that was excellent and very uh, comprehensive. Um, we're asking everyone to, if you have questions, uh, she does have um, some time. To, we'll take about uh, four questions. Um, so please go ahead and get started. I realize some people may have to jump off because they have other calls um, or other appointments. We thank you for joining us. But please, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, we, were, we are now taking uh, questions from folks. So please go ahead and ask away. Do we have any? Uh, not yet. Okay, well, I'm going to ask a question, um, and this is related to the um, prison and jail population. Yeah. And I received a email from um, Jesse Jackson's push campaign where they were advocating for uh, jails and prisons to release elderly inmates yep. um, because of the COVID situation. Can you expand a little bit on that and how social justice, how this is really yeah. uh, providing an opportunity for advocates of social justice to, to address some of these issues that before were not even under consideration? Yeah, so so um, I'm sure many of you know, so, so it, it's been really interesting to learn about this, and I think this is such a critically important issue. So the first is the issue with, with jails, right? So, so jails, there are about 200,000 people who move in and out of jails every single week, every single week. In the jails in New York City, the disproportionate burden of jails on um, on uh, most of the cases that come from jails have actually been in the people who are working at the jails because of this high in and out. So one of the important things that happened, I know happened in San Francisco, was just to get people who didn't need to be um, uh, held in jails um, out. And so there's a heavy movement for decarceration and just thinking about what we can do in our criminal justice system that doesn't require putting people uh, behind bars and in jails, you know, this is awaiting sort of a final determination. So that's probably the biggest thing on the on the on the jail side. Uh, on the prison side, I think that the, um, that many people are are really advocating for um, release of older prisoners, release of people who are on their way to being released um, um, to to move those up to really again the the, the whole principle here is um, is around. Um, and you, I'm sure, have all read stories of people who um, who uh, who've caught uh, COVID-19 and died um, within days of being released from from prison. Um, so I think the the, the criminal justice uh, this has helped us to uh, those people who have been advocating for criminal justice reform, shining a light on the injustice in our incarceration system, uh, to really advocate in in ways that are also just quite sensible in a pandemic. Um, that we have to do in order to uh, decrease, um, uh, you know, just the injustice of having people die in these congregate settings um, where it's very difficult, if not impossible, to socially distance. Keeping our communities safe, the people who are working in those settings, as well as the people who in, in the neighboring areas, because people are moving in and out of jail, and to do this in a way that, that is, sen is sensible. And I think the, the opportunity with COVID-19 for people who are advocates for uh, for reform like this is to link this for the pandemic, but to to link it to the broader social justice message so that it's something that is hopefully more sustainable over time as well. It's a critically important area. And if you look, um, you know, what we're seeing right now, if, if you start to look at the data on the outbreaks, you realize we are never going to get this under control unless we really pay attention uh, to these settings. Um, and what's happening right now in Terminal Island down in LA is really uh, is really concerning, and I think will be California's big face uh, face uh, be faced with this as well. Okay, Dr. Bibbins Domingo, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first is, what can we do about helping with tracing efforts? Yeah, good. So contact tracing—that's uh, the big hot topic. <laughs> um, UCSF is um, UCSF. Um, actually, it was providing the training, has been providing the training for the city 
and uh, recently partnered with the state of California to do this. My understanding is that the state has been interested in first in using state workers who might not be um, might not be utilized currently as as uh, as the, as that workforce. My personal feeling is that, um, and many people's feeling is that we're going to need a contact tracing workforce for a long time, <laughs> and it's going to be a mix probably of volunteers as well as people who um, who will be paid to do this. And I think many, some are, there's some interest in this being a, you know, sort of a, a workforce development type of activity. But as, as we slowly open up, people will go back to their regular day jobs, and then we will continue to need people to do contact tracing. So I would say stay tuned. A lot of people, every time I do talks like this, people ask to volunteer, and I, I think they're just getting things up and running, and I think you'll hear more and more about this, and because UCSF is driving a lot of the training, you'll, you'll hear more directly from us. Okay, one more question. Um, are there any groups or foundations that um, we can donate to um, to help with helping these issues? And support yeah. these efforts? Yeah, super, super good question. I'm happy to, to pass along this. I, I would say that the groups that I, 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 well, I will say where I personally donate. But I think, I think a lot about um, these high risk communities as being um, as, as, um, as investing in those social determinants that we need for the long term. I, I personally have thought a lot about the, the food issue because I think it's quite striking when you see the level of food insecurity that, that's, that's happening right now. I think if, if you're inclined to think about social justice issues related to criminal justice or our homeless populations, I think that there are many outstanding groups that are doing work in those specific communities. Um, and then I know that right now there is a, an effort to think about how we can think in a more systematic way, specifically in our Black and, and Latinx communities, and um, that we can work in a more coordinated uh, way uh, to continue both the advocacy and investment. So I think when I see people investing, they're investing either in like hunger or shelter, or they're investing in specific, specifically high-risk populations, homeless, incarcerated, but I think there's going to be broader efforts that you'll see over time uh, related to um, re related to uh, both black and brown communities. Thank you. We have one last question for you. Given uh, the impact on COVID-19 to our black and brown communities, what can we do to advocate for more testing untied to symptoms in the most vulnerable populations? Yeah. Um, this is where I think the link, you know, people oftentimes say, oh, you know, we don't, we, um, that we did research in the mission. We, that data in the mission, I think, was very eye-opening to a lot of people in City Hall. And it may, I think it really made them realize what needs to happen in terms of expansion of testing. And in my view, what has to happen is like setting up sites directly in the communities themselves, not waiting to go to some other place. That has to be partnered with community organizations that can keep that advocacy going. And I think that um, for us, for that study, we've worked with the, the Latinx task force, but hope that all of the, our Latinx um, uh, community organizations we partner with can take that data and use it to continue to advocate because that's what's going to be required. The second aspect of it is actually just figuring out how we can help people shelter in place effectively. The biggest issue in the mission is that we have people doubled and tripled and quadrupled up in many of those places. And I can say shelter in place when, you, when I run the test for you, but if we can't figure out how to do it, we actually need services to, in order to make that a reasonable option for as many people as possible. But that's where the community-based organizations and the advocacy groups, I think, will take the data and use it to, to continue to advocate um, with, with our state and local officials. I have a question um, in regards to the elders, elderlies that are, are at home. Um, yeah. Outside of having my mom wear a mask when she goes out and, um, and trying not to let her go out um, as much, what are other suggestions that um, you may have for the elderly again that um, are, 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 in, are at home versus a, um, a, um, a in care? but they're at home 
and I try to wash down um, stuff and my mom does too, but I just want to make sure that I'm doing all that I can do for her um, while she's at home. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're probably doing the, you're probably doing all the right things. So if she's at home most of the time, that's the best thing she can be doing. And probably her risk is really just, you know, anyone else who comes into the house, you or anyone else, as we all start to trickle back to work, is making sure that the, that us bringing the risk into the house, we contain it. She's probably safe as though, you know, being at home, going outside only in limited times and with the masks. And I think as, I think as we've all thought about it, it's like, how do you, how do I get my son, who might have my mother lives with us too, when he comes home, I'm worried about washing him down as opposed to like, you know, doing anything more with her. And then I think really the mental health aspect of really the people who have to remain sheltered in place longer is probably the thing we have to spend the most time thinking about. Um, and because, because that's hard. I think we'll keep people safe from the virus, but it is hard not to have other contact with lots of other people. I think that's, that's going to be the challenge. And I'm going to guess over time, we're going to try to figure out how to do that in the safest way possible. Yeah. Well, I make people wash their hands when they come in the door and literally take their jacket or coat off, you know, yeah. just, but I just wanted to make sure that we were on the right track. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bivens Domingo. We really appreciate you taking the time to address us. Um, this was uh, really informative, and I have to say, um, as a UC University of California employee, I'm, I'm just delighted and thrilled to know that there are people like you that are out there that look like us and that represent us and also represent the University of California in such a level of, of excellence. And um, we would uh, definitely will be sharing um, your uh, PowerPoint presentation with everyone. We will also send out um, the link to this conversation so that you can share it with members of your community as well. So thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Not at all. Thank you. Sorry for going late, but thank you so much for all of the work that you, you are all doing and uh, really pleased to be able to talk with you today.